Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, hey everybody, welcome to the Psalm 15 episode of our study in the key chapters of God's Word. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks so much for being a part of this study. Just looking forward to going to Psalm 15 with you. I love this psalm because it helps us see the kind of life that God calls us to. And now we have a lot to cover, so let's just jump right into Psalm 15. Hope you've already read it. We'll just start right in verse 1 and just work right through each of the five verses of Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1, asks the question, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Now, the tabernacle there is just this dwelling place of the Lord. It was a tent at first. Later on, it was built to be the temple. Even like the holy hill there, that's probably the mount where God met Abraham and where the temple was eventually built. But even more importantly, both of these terms are speaking about dwelling in fellowship with the Lord. And that's made clear with this word abide. The word abide can also mean sojourn or dwell. And it's, it's not the idea of just showing up from time to time, but rather residing permanently. And so the question that's being asked here is ultimately who can be with the Lord permanently? Who could be with the Lord all the time? In other words, who is going to be going to heaven? Not the names of the people, but what are they like? Now, this is a key point because yesterday we briefly looked at Psalm 5, verse 4, which says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. And so we're seeing here with all these scriptures coming together that not everyone's going to be with the Lord in heaven. And that's because heaven is a place of total holiness and perfection. Everyone and everything in heaven perfectly obeys the Lord. There is no disobedience. There's no deviation from his plan. There's no grumbling. Heaven operates according to God's design. And so this psalm is asking the question and answering the question, since heaven is a place of holy perfection, who can even be there? Now, I find it interesting that this psalm does not respond with, well, those are who are part of Israel or those who are keeping the covenant of God. And that's because although God's people are in covenant with him, those who are truly in covenant with him will live it out. Even the book of James in the New Testament later on teaches the principle that we live what we believe. If you want to see what a man believes, look at how he lives. And so this psalm is telling us that we can recognize those who are bound for heaven by their character because their life is being transformed by their faith. Now, having said that, we need to remember that this is old covenant language here. Here we are in the Old Testament, and we know from the rest of the Bible, even the Old Testament, that no one can earn our own place in heaven. Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. If you look up at the Psalm 14, just the Psalm right before this, Psalm 14, verse 3 says, they have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now that verse might be familiar to you because it's quoted in Romans 3. Romans 3 then concludes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we know from the whole counsel of Scripture that no one deserves or earns their own place in heaven. They all need a righteousness to give to them. That's why even the Old Testament sacrifices, they had to have that righteousness from that animal, that sinless animal given to them. We, of course, know that all of that was pointing to the righteousness of Christ that he gives to us when we call upon him to be our Savior. And so if we have truly called upon the Lord for salvation, for forgiveness, we will be numbered among God's people. And those who have truly called upon him, we will see certain characteristics in their life. I like how the King James translates this question in verse 1. It says, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Uh, what does the person who is going to heaven look like? Well, verse 2 begins to answer this question. It says, He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Walking with integrity, or uprightly as some translations might say, is just a biblical way of picturing a person who has strength of character. They do not cower in fear. Instead, they stand strong. They walk strong because they know that what they are doing is righteous. In fact, verse 2 says this person works righteousness. In other words, when you look at the character of their life and the focus of their life and the things they do, the things they create, they produce righteousness. The things that they make, they do, that they're involved with, they're righteous things. Verse 2 also says that this person speaks truth in their heart. This is a vital component of God's people. Even truth down in the inward part of their being, deep in their own thoughts, deep in their own nooks and crannies of their soul that no one really sees. God's people fill their minds with God's truth. They love his truth. They love to dwell upon it and meditate on it. And they let God's truth settle so deeply into their soul that the echo of their heart is the echo of God's truth. Not the world's truth, not self-pity, not distorted views of others, not hatred or anger or hostility. Truth, God's truth, truth that is accurate and faithful. In fact, so often when we have pain in our hearts, it's often because we're dwelling upon things that are not true. 
Maybe we lament over our past. We worry about our future. We think about what was said to us or done to us or not said or done, and our heart feels pain. And yet the righteous person takes all of that thinking and runs it through the grid of truth. And then they let all of the falsehoods just fall to the cutting floor. They don't wallow in self-pity. They don't wallow in fear and doubt. They don't live by regrets. They don't harbor bitterness or unforgiveness. They allow their heart to be filled with God's truth. And they develop the discipline of pushing out anything that's not true. Well, going on to verse 3, it also says, This person, he does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. God's people do not slander others. We often think that slander is saying something that's not true, but as long as it is true, we're okay saying about someone. But the idea here is more along this idea of spying things out or seeking negative information about other people, taking in and listening to and spreading out negative information about someone else. This is so tempting in our world today. I mean, so much news is simply just gossip and slander. God's person, God's righteous person, has learned to tame their tongue, to tame their mind, so that they don't harm the reputation of others. Likewise, they don't do evil to their neighbor. When you think about the community of the Jewish folks back then, and their towns were small, they would have known everyone, everyone would have known each other. And here we're seeing that the righteous person is aware of their own personal responsibility, their fellow men, and they do good rather than evil. Verse 3 even says they don't harm their friend. The NES says they don't take up a reproach. The idea is that when someone trusts us to be one of their friends, we have a responsibility to not get easily offended or be quick to judge them. Whenever someone lets us into their life, we're going to see sin. I mean, the fact is we're all sinners. It's just how we are. But when we see someone else's sin, we should not be quick to condemn them or quick to be offended. It doesn't mean we embrace their sin or condone it, but we have the humility to recognize that none of us are perfect, so we extend grace with our friends, even as we do our neighbor. Now, this idea is expanded in verse 4, kind of seeing the flip side of it, because verse 4 says, In whose eyes the reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. And so here we're seeing that God's people don't love or celebrate rebellion against God, and they honor instead those who fear him. Now, the world does things the exact opposite. The world loves to portray scenarios where the bad guy is actually good, you know, not really good, but they portray him as though he's good, and the good guy is actually bad. It's so common for the world to portray those who are trying to obey God. They're just the hypocrites. And those who are in rebellion to God, well, they're actually the people of true virtue. God's people don't get caught up in that kind of game. We recognize that no one is perfect, not even God's people, but we don't condone sin or rebellion in any quarter, and we celebrate righteousness and submission to God in every corner. Likewise, verse 4 tells us that this person is so committed to their own word, as in keeping their word, that once they say it, they will do it. You can bank on it. They will keep their word even if it hurts them. In fact, verse 5 says they're not seeking to take advantage of anyone. Verse 5 says he does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take up a bribe against the innocent. Now, two characteristics are being spoken of here in verse 5. The first one is talking about lending money at interest. Other translations might call this usury. And the idea is that the righteous person does not seek to take advantage of people who are in desperate situations where they're in so much need, they'll even agree to a foolish loan because they have no other options. The righteous person does not engage in such practices, nor does the righteous person have anything to do with hurting or harming innocent people. They don't take bribes. They don't give bribes. They don't engage in injustice. They do what is right in civil and legal domains. And then this psalm ends with this great promise. It says, he who does these things will never be shaken. Now, why is that? Well, because they are walking with God and they have the strength of his spirit within them, enabling them to withstand whatever storms of life come their way. They are like the wise builder who built their house upon the rock. Those who follow God's ways are not promised a life free of storms, but they are promised that when the storms come, they will not be destroyed by them. And so this psalm here is just a great window into the kind of person who is walking in fellowship with God, and that's because we can't truly live out these principles unless we are in fellowship with the Lord. Our Lord walks in integrity, and if we lack integrity, we have strayed away from God. Our Lord walks in righteousness, and if we don't walk in righteousness, we have strayed away from God. Our Lord speaks truth, and when we don't speak truth, we've walked from God. Our Lord does not slander or do evil or take up reproach against his people. And when we do these things, we're walking away from God. Our Lord is not pleased with the reprobate, and when we are, we don't have the mind of God. Our Lord honors those who fear the Lord, and when we don't, we don't have the Lord's perspective on that situation. The promise of our Lord can be taken to the bank, and when our word is wishy-washy, we're not walking with him. Our Lord does not take advantage of people, and if we do, we likewise have walked away from him. And when we think about this, if at any point we find out we've walked away from God, we're not in fellowship with him in certain areas, 
well, it's just time for us to repent and return back to him and his path. And so this is a great psalm to learn and memorize. It's not just an academic psalm. This is a psalm for life. This is how to live life. The Lord is giving us here a path of righteousness, a path of peace, a path of love and joy. And so as you wrap up Psalm 15, why not just spend some time with the Lord reviewing these verses and measuring them against your own life and, and asking the Lord to bring your life into conformity with these principles. But even as we look at these truths, they're so clarifying for righteous living we have to deal with the fact that this, this psalm is asking who can dwell with God. And then it lists off these characteristics. And if we're honest with ourselves, none of us have met God's standard. If this is the standard, all of us have fallen short of it. All of us have failed this test. The only person who has ever fulfilled this standard is our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we need him to be our Savior. That is why we need his righteousness imputed to us. And so this psalm should also send us to our knees where we confess to God that we are sinners needing his forgiveness and grace. We acknowledge that we have not met his standard. We need his son to be our savior. And we put our trust in the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ who alone fulfilled God's standards and gives his righteousness to those who ask him. Well, we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for being a part of this study in Psalm 15. We look forward to joining you tomorrow as we go to Psalm 19. We'll see you then. God bless.